Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slaughter. Hello and welcome to another Star Wars lore video. We are continuing our discussion of Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, of course, so if you haven't seen the movie, you know, maybe watch it before watching this video or even going on YouTube and Twitter because, to be honest, you're lucky if you haven't been spoiled yet. Anyway, today, with that out of the way, we will be talking about the final battle of the film, The Attack on Exegol. Now, this is actually my third or fourth video on the subject. I've covered the battle itself, I've covered the Zeiston class Star Destroyer, and I've covered the circumstances around the building of the Sith fleet. However, today I want to look at the other side and examine how the Resistance managed to get so many allies to aid their assault against perhaps the greatest fleet ever seen in the the entire galaxy. First though, we do need a bit of context, and a good place to start would be the New Republic fleet and demilitarization after the Battle of Endor. So first of all, and this should be clear by Star Wars Episode 7, the New Republic didn't entirely demilitarize after Endor, however they did see a major shift away from ongoing starship production, and ships which were produced, like say the MC-85, probably were not as aggressively armed as the they could have been. Still, at least to some degree, new capital ships and starfighters were made and they were placed across the galaxy. We see emerging philosophical and political differences at this point, with various New Republic senders believing that there should be a strong central military power which would protect the various New Republic member systems, while the New Republic generally seemed instead to lean towards a more diffuse method where individual systems would be largely responsible for protecting themselves with the central fleet having a less important role, sort of like a pre-Clone Wars era Republic. Keep that in mind because it will be important for later. Anyway, with the attack on Starkiller base, much of the New Republic's fleet was destroyed, but as I've covered in another video, there were definitely New Republic outposts across the galaxy, there would have been other fleets, and certainly it's not reasonable to say that every single capital ship was in the Hosnian system, although hundreds were nonetheless destroyed. The novelization for The Last Jedi actually specifically says that the surviving fleets of the New Republic after the Hosnian Cataclysm were largely grabbed up by senators who used them to shore up their own systems. In a way, this decentralization would have almost been a benefit, because it means that the First Order, even with a devastating preemptive strike, could not totally leave the galaxy defenseless. Many individual systems, even without a New Republic naval remnant, would have developed their own defenses, and we know for example from the Allegiance comics that the Mon Calamari had their own Starfleet, which they donated to the Resistance. Why am I telling you all of this stuff? Well, because I think it's important information that you'll need to understand why there are still so many warships in a galaxy which seemingly has no central power. So here's what happens. We learn from the Rise of Skywalker that Lando and Chewie go to the core systems to look for allies. I think we'll eventually learn that the message out of Crate was actually blocked, but more than that, I think it will be this sort of existential threat posed by the Sith, which ends up being what explains why eventually after over a year of invasion, the citizens of the galaxy join the resistance in rising up against the Sith. So, when you look at the fleet, you'll see not only a mix of freighters and lots of smaller ships, but also large warships. There are several new Mon Calamari variants. We see some that are very similar to MC-75s. We see some that I and others think resemble the ships shown during the Hosnian Cataclysm in Episode 7. We see lots of ships used by the Resistance, including the MC-85, like the Radis and the various escort ships. And just generally, it's a mix, I think, think of proper military warships, plus pirates and mercenaries and citizens and whoever else. As one of the Imperials says, it's not a navy, it's just people. Although it's clear that some worlds, like Corellia, did fall to the First Order, it makes sense that the core would still have a lot of the resources and the allies needed by the Resistance. These warships would have been the remnants of the New Republic Navy, which had been hoarded by Senators. They would have been individual defense fleets, which had not yet been stomped out by the First Order. 
It was probably long forgotten rebel cells, maybe some ex-imperials. It would have been capital ships scavenged or managed by droids. Basically the fractured elements of the military that the First Order had broken but not yet fully eliminated. All of that combined gives us the massive fleet we see at the end of Episode 9. Does that fully explain everything? No, not quite. I mean there's no real reason why the models that already existed, like the MC-75 and the Bunker Buster and whatever else appear so frequently, same with Nebulon Bs and CR-90s. But I think overall you guys get the idea. That however is all I have for this topic. Today's hashtag ask at question of the day comes from multi iron dude who asks how do you think the Yuzhan Vong would face off against a fleet of Imperial Zeiston class warships? And as always when it comes to the Yuzhan Vong and super weapons it really has to do with how their technology and specifically I think how their Dovin basils would adapt to the Zeiston's axial super laser. Either way, the Yuzhan Vong was a fairly small force, and had it not actually gained some ground in the galaxy, as I've discussed various times, the war wouldn't have been so long or so bloody, so I think Zeistens would have been a great form of asset denial, because not only would the world ships have been shot out of the sky one by one, but worst case scenario when the Yuzhan Vong capture a planet and start to terraform it, well, see ya. All in all, I think most iterations of the Empire, or even a competently run New Republic, are able to to steamroll the Vong, so if with Zeist in classes, I think that just becomes even more obvious. Thanks for the question though, if you guys have one you'd like me to address at the end of a future video, leave it down below with the hashtag AskEck. Hope you guys have a great New Year's Eve, I hope 2020 is better than 2019 was, or if 2019 was amazing, that 2020 is at least just as good. For me, this was one of the best years of my life, probably the best given all the time I've got to spend with my son and my wife and the progress the YouTube channel has made. So thanks as always guys. Until next time, have a great one and may the force be with you.